Hello, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Emma Griffin, I'm the president of the Royal Historical Society. And I'm really delighted to welcome so many of you to today's digital history event. Well, it's a real pleasure to introduce our panel. Our chair today is Ruth Aynert. Ruth is a professor of literary history and digital humanities at Queen Mary at the University of London. She's a specialist in early modern literary culture and her books include the rise of prison literature in the 16th century and an edited collection, Reforming the Psalms of Tudor England. Since 2012, Ruth's work has increasingly focused on applying data science to research in the humanities, and she is currently the PI for the largest humanities project ever funded in the UK, Living with Machines, based at the British Library and the Alan Turing Institute. Along with Ruth today are Dan Edelstein. Dan is the William H. Bonsall Professor of French at Stanford University and Faculty Director at Stanford Inter Introductory Studies. He's the author and editor of a ridiculous number of books. He works mainly on 18th century France with research interests in literature, history, political thought, and digital humanities. And amongst many other things, he's collaborated on the mapping the Republic of Letters project, which in turn has led to digital tool building projects. Um, along with Dan is Marianne Kowalski. She's the Joseph Fitzpatrick SJ Distinguished Professor Emerita of History and Medieval Studies at Fordham University. She too is the author and editor of a very large number of books. She works on medieval English history with a focus on specific regional histories, the role of women, and more recently, maritime history. She's become very involved in digital histories as the webmaster for the Center of Medieval Studies, which hosts 20 different digital projects. In addition, today we have John Lawrence, Professor of Modern British History at the University of Exeter. He too has enjoyed a very wide ranging publishing career which tacks a journey from 19th century political history into modern British social, cultural and political history. More recently, he, like me actually, has been involved as a co-I on the Living with Machines project, which has brought him to digital history and is how he, Ruth and I all began working together. And Katrina Navicus, Professor of History at the University of Hertfordshire. She's got experience working on numerous funded projects and fellowships and is expert in the history of protest and collective action and contested spaces in Britain from the 18th century to the present. I think it's no exaggeration to say that she's one of the leading practitioners of digital history working in Britain today. So with this wonderful panel, um, I invite you to sit back. I'll hand the chair over to Ruth um, and enjoy our panel on digital history. There you go, Ruth. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks so much for the introduction, Emma. Um, we're really delighted to be here today. Um, this is an event that's co-hosted between the um, uh, RHS and Living with Machines. Um, so Emma, John and I, as she suggested, have been working together now for the last four and a half years on the project Living with Machines. This is a UKRI funded project which brings together historians, data scientists, curators and library professionals, computational linguists and others. And the aim is to leverage large scale digitized collections using computational methods. And through that, we wanted to understand the impact of industrialization on the lives of ordinary people in the long 19th century. But this project wasn't just about doing digital history. It was also an experiment in interdisciplinary collaboration. And the point of the day was to try and open up that discussion about what such work looks like to the wider community. And to this end, we've brought together these amazing people who have experience in this space but we also wanted to convene a wider discussion, which is why we've <laughs> invited you to be here as well. So um, we're going to suggest that um, you should write questions as you think of them in the Q&A um, uh, so that we can kind of keep the conversation going. Um, we'll probably will lead with the questions that we've um, thought of in advance for the first 50 minutes, and then we'll open the questions to the floor. But it'd be really great if questions come in as we go, because um, we might be able to um, direct discussions in different ways. So um, thank you already for your involvement and I invite everyone else to the screen. So just to begin with, um, I thought it'd be useful if we went around the panel, um, just to say, what is a digital historian? Do you consider yourself a digital historian? And how did you enter this space? Um, maybe let's begin with Dan. Uh, thanks, Ruth. It's great to see you again. It's great, great to be on this panel. Um, you know, I, I think back, I'm actually um, in Paris right now, which is uh, first for the last time I was here for a long time was in 2002, 2003, when I was writing my dissertation. And that was just when Google was starting to become really common. 
Uh, and I always sort of, you know, half joked that I wrote the first Google dissertation because uh, it was the first time you could just like randomly put these queries into a search engine and, and you know, find things out that, you know, might have just been really hard to track down. And um, so that was sort of, I guess, in, in, a, in one way, how I, I just always became interested in like, what can we, how can technology help us um, as, as, as humanists? Um, and then, you know, as, as other technologies became available, um, I just got really interested in that. Um, I don't, it's interesting because I don't really think of myself as a digital historian, and maybe I can say a bit more about that later. Um, but I, I feel a, a bit that these days, you know, to some extent, we're all digital historians, right? We're a bit like uh, uh, Monsieur Jourdain and uh, Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, like, oh, I'm speaking in prose. Uh, you know, it, it's it's kind of hard to do anything without, you know, using digital, digital media, you know, um, so many questions like nowadays might start by you know looking something up on ngram or or doing a word search um so so i think it's very interesting the way in which um all of us have become digital historians and maybe that's also changed what it means to sort of identify as one today thanks dan that's a really helpful opening um can we get to marianne next turn myself um, my trajectory is a little bit different because when I was in graduate school, I had to write my thesis. So that's how far back. So my first introduction was through key punched cards because I went in 1980 in the summer to a Newberry Library, uh, NEH sponsored school to teach um, quantitative methods to historians. Uh, and it was an eye opener, completely changed the way I did things. I was an economic historian, so this made sense, but it was really about demography and family history. It was not just quantitative history, but it influenced me to uh, code over uh, many thousands of debt cases using the old green and white uh, coding sheets. You had to use numeric codes. I suspect I'm the only one on the panel who's had to do that. And um, then when I moved to Fordham and I finished my thesis, I moved to mainframe databases none of all of which are extinct now. Uh, and then I was very happy to embrace uh, PCs when they came along. Uh, and I started teaching students as part of a regular seminar how to design uh, historical databases. And as a result, a lot of my most about 70 to 80 percent of my MA and PhD students have used databases in their work, um, mainly for prosbographical analysis. But it was a student who got me into um, making the leap from the desktop to online, he um, had started um, his a website called the Internet History Sourcebooks, which at, within five years were getting 21 million hits a year. I mean, it was actually extraordinary. It was one of the first sites to pr produce uh, translations of primary sources uh, for free. I mean, you didn't have to buy a reader and you had the, it was all categorized and had short introductions. And that made me want to learn more about the power of the internet. I learned a little bit of front page. And then when I was in an administrative position as the director of the Center for Medieval Studies for about 16 years, I consciously supported digital projects for students and faculty. Um, these were mostly medieval kinds of projects and started using digital projects in my undergraduate seminars as well. And I would say since about 2004, I have been, um, my own work has largely been on creating resources through searchable databases um, uh, and through, uh, you know, text-based blogs and things like that. Thanks so much. It's really good to hear the kind of different ways that people have come into this <laughs> place. Maybe, um, uh, maybe John, we can come to you next. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, as you know, Ruth, on the project on living with machines, I always label myself an analog historian. But but like Dan says, I'm not sure that's meaningful for anyone these days. And actually, it's a bit of a lie for me because I have a sort of, although most of my work has been close reading of political, cultural, social text, very much about language, well, two things really. One, I've always had a sort of sideline that's much more quantitative and done a lot of work, um, demographic and economic history actually in the early days, and I've carried that on. But but actually more to the point, in the last 15 years, I was becoming more and more intrigued by what you could do if you went back to all the work I was doing in the 90s with the methods of computational linguistics. So in a way, that's why I was so attracted to the project because it seemed to me that it was a way of better understanding. I had some understanding because I was the editor and indeed the 
PhD examiner for um, Luke Blacksill's important monograph, um, The War of Words. But um, I wanted to be more involved on the inside. And so that's, as I say, that's what attracted me to living with machines and learning a lot more about digital methods. Thank you, John. You've been a really kind of good, you know, a good friend and a good translator uh, across the disciplines in the project. And so I think that's really important when we think about how we communicate back as well. And I think we'll come back to that in a bit, mm -hmm. what, what it means, like, do we communicate in a silo or do we communicate back to our home disciplines? Um, Katrina, can I come to you next? Yeah, um, I would describe myself as a bit of a hacker in terms of um, I was trained very much traditionally as a historian. Um, and then I went to the map library in the Bodleian because I wanted to have a map in my thesis and then discovered the sort of the start of ArcGIS and realised that actually mapping was going to give me some tools that I couldn't do with pen and paper. So I think we're all coming to this from different trajectories at whichever stage of what if you're Gen Z or Gen X or whatever, it, I think that that shapes the way you're trained. And I'm sure we'll talk about training um, later, but certainly I just self-train myself. I work out what tools would help my own research. So um, I've dabbled with um, text mining when I did a, a residency at the British Library in their digital scholarship department, where um, again, it depends on what what you're looking at, but they happen to have all the 19th century newspapers, which again, um, this project is using in really interesting ways. But um, so I tried to learn Python and failed um, and realized that actually I'm much happier with GIS. Um, and so then I did a project with Sam Griffiths at the Bartlett Institute of Architecture um, at UCL, um, looking at whether we could use space syntax methods to apply them to historical maps. And that I think was the most fruitful um, element of using digital tools in my research, um, giving me a, a whole light of things that I could um, use in terms of um, isovists and, and busyness of roads and all the things that I was interested in, but actually being able to look at that digitally helped me. So currently I'm, I'm still mapping my um, political meetings and protests um, in in various ways, but certainly I think, um, as we'll see in this discussion, a lot of it is making things up and according to what particular um, research question you have at that moment, if you're not involved in, say, a big project that has um, multiple people involved, quite often you're sort of cherry picking what you need. Thanks. I think we've got lots of different threads coming out of this about, you know, picking up skills versus collaborating, you know, whether there's whether the tools drive the method or the, the research question comes first or the data comes first. Um, but also one of the things that is occurring to me is that kind of back history of um, using quantitative approaches and the status of digital history at the moment at the moment. So this is a kind of feels like a very pressing issue that we're, we're being urged more and more by our institutions, by the way that we access data into this kind of space of digital history. Um, but there are lots of feelings about that in, in our home departments about, you know, the kind of neoliberal agenda and whether we're being pushed to apply for big grants and all of these kind of political issues. So I have a question about the status of digital history today. Um, and maybe how that varies between the UK and the US because we have people who've worked in both spaces. But I wondered if a good way to come in, into this is going back to Marianne, because you talked a little bit about coming into this via economic history. And of course, there's a much clearer kind of quantitative uh, bent in that sub-discipline. Um, so all of this narrative about the digital turn and the digital humanities, um, that feels like a kind of parallel argument that's going on to something that has a longer back life in, in that sub-discipline. So I wonder if we can come to you first. Um, so yeah, we're talking about what's the status of digital history, but thinking a little bit about that back that backstory. Right, but as a medievalist who's mainly working on 14th century, um, there's only so quantitative that you could be. I mean, in, in, in terms of, as I discovered very quickly, so you learn all these tools and it's 
kind of ridiculous. We really just need cross, you know, some percentages and occasionally a standard deviation. You don't, it doesn't really help to do much advanced statistics for most medieval work. The kind of thing I'm doing is tracking trade and things like that. I would say though that um, I'm very much in the medieval studies tradition. I have no degrees in history. My first degree is in French literature. And I then went on to get degrees in medieval studies. And I was the director of the Center for Medieval Studies. So although I have a research life that's focused on medieval, you know, economic history to a great extent and women and children and things like that. Um, really my teaching and most of where I'm coming from is medieval studies, which is an early, um, I think leader in digital humanities in the United States, certainly. I mean, the kind of origin myth is, you know, um, you know, the, the Father Busa helped found, you know, a medieval, uh, a scholar of, uh, a scholar of medieval philosophy. So, um, I think that medievalists and especially literary scholars more than historians have helped propel uh, digital humanities forward in the United States more than historians. Economic historians work with spreadsheets and they're cleometricians for a large, to a great extent. And they have increasingly grown isolated. Economic historians like myself don't publish in the American Journal of Economic History, but we do publish in the British Economic History Review. That's really interesting. Um, Dan, do, do you want to come here and talk? I mean, I, I think you probably have some quite different things to say about the status of digital history because it does feel like we're, we have these kind of two parallel stories going alongside one another. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I wonder, I've been thinking a lot about the funding question and, you know, you know, one of the things that um, is was so remarkable about and is so remarkable about your project is like the, the amount of funding you received. And actually, that's like, you know, it, we always sort of think of, of the US as being, you know, having more resources in general and, and the UK is a difficult environment. Actually, I don't think that's the case when it comes to funding large projects. You know, the, the biggest grant you can get from the NEH is about, I mean, last time I looked, it was like $350,000. Like that's actually not a lot of money if you want to hire postdocs and do something over mul multiple years. Um, so in, in a way, I think that um, we have very, like the, what, I, you know, I'm not, I don't, wouldn't at all claim to be an expert here, but it does like from looking in from the outside, it sort of feels like in, in Britain, there's still more of these larger, uh, these possibilities of doing these like really big projects. And in the States, it feels like there was a lot of excitement, maybe, gosh, almost 10 years ago, and everyone was predicting that this was going to be the wave of the future kind of feels like that's petered out, to be honest. I mean, I, you don't really see, I mean, well, there aren't any jobs in history, but uh, there certainly aren't. So this idea that, oh, if you're a digital historian, you're going to get in, um, that's fine. The people also, I think, this is sort of what I was hinting at earlier, like on the one hand, yes, all of us now do more digital history just in our in our day to day. But I also feel like there's definitely, at least in the States, a, like a group of, of very professional digital historians who are who are just so much more technical than any of us uh, like 10 years ago were that it's almost led it to be sort of an offshoot of its own that's much more interested and much more focused on methodological questions um and and they have conversations often that i just you know i just have trouble following because the it's it's not it's no longer really sort of this this interesting hybrid of like well here's a research question here's a tool can we sort of think about how these things interact it's really oh you know well I ran this R script and you know here uh, you know <laughs> et cetera you know speaking something statistical that I, I don't usually follow so I think that that's a really nice point because I think there is a kind of generational divide and it's moving a pace right that um, the the camp is growing wider that more people are kind of much compu more computationally uh, driven more computationally literate are kind of coming into the field so they're pushing forward the cutting edge um, some of us who kind of entered sideways and thought of ourselves as analog um, we, we've entered the space through collaboration and we've picked up some things along the way we've kind of um, built up these kind of um, abilities to uh, you know, it's got, I've got a little phrase book, like I speak, you know, conversational French, but it, I'm not fluent in it. And, and, it's, and it's the same um, in, in this space. So I think this brings us nicely to a, a question I wanted to ask around, um, around the kind of way that digital history feels a little bit closed off for many historians to them. So um, what are the kind of barriers that we see 
in terms of um, access to digital history in terms of skills um, and where my opportunities open up through collaboration. Um, so I was wondering if um, Katrina might want to come in here. Yeah, I, I think what I found as a kind of digital history amateur is that one of the things that you have to accept about software or tools is that quite often it's um, you have to hack it to make it work for your particular purposes. And I think what perhaps is the barrier is that there isn't this kind of equivalent of Google for people to just plug in what they want. And there is a lack of perhaps that training or education. It is there. But it's much easier, perhaps, to get a standard journal article out for your work purposes, rather than to spend the time going through, um, you know, a training course to get, you know, that's a long process. And it's something that we don't generally teach in a, in an undergraduate curriculum. And certainly at, at Hertfordshire, we did have a digital history stream and very few students took it and we had to take it off because it's just not seen as a history for a lot of people and I, I do think that there's there is a difference between using tools for um visualization public engagement type things which I think most people are happy with engaging with and the more quantitative um coding type um material that that there is a big step change to learning so I think it, it it's it's that training element that people are scared of perhaps or at least just don't have the time to do if they're an established historian and they're not encouraged perhaps to do at an earlier career stage I think that's absolutely right um John I think you might have something to add here that would be quite fitting well, I agree with what Katrina is saying. Um, I think that there probably is also a scepticism about, I remember talking with you, Ruth, about the old sort of com computer science adage of rubbish in, rubbish out, that there's a sort of scepticism amongst analog historians that perhaps a lot of digital history has been done where people haven't been careful enough about critically engaging with the material itself that they're applying their tools to now i think that's particularly true when historians aren't in the room you know we on the project quite often talk about uh, various extraordinary claims that are made about you know when british people were happiness uh, happiest when you look at those sorts of articles you discover usually that they are just data science exercises running you know long long programs and coming up with a result. Um, but I think that scepticism is real and that sort of work compounds it so that we have a large, you know, I, I, I've always seen with living machines that one of our key tasks has to be to try and challenge that, that sort of way of thinking about digital history and show that it can be equally critical in how that it, it thinks about sources breaking down what I've always called the bag of words problem to think about, well, what are we actually analyzing here? um how how do you scale up the techniques of source criticism that we're trained at the moment to, to apply to individual sources and do those at scale and i think that's the key really to it, it should be the key to convincing a lot of historians that they should be able to do this or at least understand and work with people who can because at the moment a hell of a lot of people think they don't have to because it's flawed but actually the methods are so powerful and the insights that can be drawn if you do do that critical work are so extraordinary that we should be doing it. Thanks, John. That's uh, almost evangelical. And um, Marianne, do you have something to add to that? Right. I'd like to go back to the uh, difference between UK and US and also the point that uh, Dan made about funding, because I think that there's an further, there's an increasingly wide funding divide and I see it mainly in the United States because for me, most of the projects that I know about in the UK tend to be these bigger, larger, well-funded, multi-year projects that have a beginning and an end. In the US, uh, there are very few kind of foundation and government grant, grants that are available to anything but the Research One universities. And um, I work at a Research Two university with a heavier teaching load. There is no Center for Digital Humanities. You have to find other um, strategies 
uh, to get around some of the problems because DH is expensive. That is probably the, one of the things that is most important and to me is a stumbling block as much as training. It, you know, you can learn. I mean, I've watched a lot of YouTube videos. You know, that's how you learn a lot of things. You learn from other people. But in the long run, if you want to do any kind of bigger project that requires um, data developers, you need funding because those IT professionals are very expensive. They can get hired by, you know, the commercial sector, and they don't really want to work for the academic sector unless they're paid similarly. And my experience is that the Research One universities are putting way more money. They have centers for digital humanities. They have um, starter grants, initial grants. Uh, that are completely unavailable to most four-year colleges and most uh, R2 universities. Um, I'm not saying that we're without resources because there are ways to get around this and we can talk about that later on. But to me, that is a growing danger is the rich are getting richer when it comes to DH. I think that's absolutely right. And I mean, I think I should say that we're a really unique project that they I mean the funding council that funded us have said that they won't be funding any more projects at this scale they might be funding infrastructure in the UK at a similar scale but not projects so it's kind of it's kind of a one-off and the the normal ceiling is I mean it's still pretty big 1.5 million it's going up to in a, in a couple of months at, in the Arts and Humanities Research Council but when you're trying to do something ambitious when it requires data storage when it requires compute these are all massive costs and it is very hard to kind of um, sustain that and actually project-based solutions are also bad because when we're thinking of sustaining the outputs of these kinds of research um, as Marianne you'll know from having hosted all of these uh, projects it requires ongoing funding and one of the things that NEH has got right from what I know of it is they have these like, little bits of money to help with the upkeep of, of outputs but our, our situation in the UK is that things like cl close down there's no there's no follow-on funding you, you can't get, get a, you know, they, they will follow on something for other things, but we, we, you can't support the kind of maintenance of a, an, a website or a, of a resource. It's kind of, once it ends, it ends. And that means all of this kind of resource that's flowing into projects, it's kind of, there's this huge headache for those who feel a kind of emotional attachment to the thing they've produced because they then happen to try and maintain it out of their personal pocket, out of their love and hack something together. Um, as things go out of date. So um, I kind of recognize some of the stuff that you're saying there as well. Um, but I think one of the things we got at in this question a little bit was that kind of, that there are kind of different kinds of digital projects. So we're kind of talking about digital history writ large, but there are projects where there might be a kind of a lone historian uh, kind of hacking something together themselves. Um, and then there are kinds of ways of collaborating to make these things happen, which require a different kinds of human infrastructure and funding. Um, um, so I think I'd really like to hear a little bit about what experience you've had as people on the panel with that kind of collaborative work um, and what that's kind of uh, opened up for you in terms of your research. Um, I wonder if Katrina, we could come to you first. Sure. Um, yeah. For the collaboration I had with the Bartlett School of Architecture, um, when I started that, I knew very little about space syntax. And I know it's it's not everyone's cup of tea, but it's a way of um, mapping street level and and building level connections in in a in, a, in layperson's terms. Um, but we deliberately had an interdisciplinary team or cross disciplinary team where I was working with um, computer scientists and people who were specialists on that, that software um, who had very little experience of historical data. So it was very interesting interchange them trying to understand what the pitfalls and, and caveats in historical data are, of which there are many, and me trying to understand um, how um, this new software and new technology could be of benefit to me as a historian. So it was deliberately framed um, to have that interdisciplinary exchange. And part of the outputs of that were, were part of that sort of thinking as well as the, the outcomes. So I, I do think it's absolutely essential to have a team that has different um, skills from different disciplines um, because that's how those sorts of projects create new knowledge. 
oh, I could not have done that on because I don't understand the, the technicalities of the software, but the people on the project also needed me to explain the historical contextual information about why that is shaped in the way that it is um, because of the, the peculiarities of history. So I do think that those sorts of projects work well What if, if all parties are understanding that they're bringing something different to the Thanks, Katrina. That's, that sounds really familiar to me. I really like what you're saying there. Dan, can we come to you next? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the collaborative dimension was really what made for me DH so much so exciting and fun. Now, when we were working on mapping the Republic of Letters, um, it was, you know, none of that would have happened if we hadn't had um, Nicole Coleman, who I know you know as well, Ruth, um, who was uh, had this sort of interesting role where she was you know, back then because we knew so, li so little about the technologies. She wasn't actually just the person who liaised, like who we worked with to build stuff, but we sort of had this like tripartite structure where you know, she was enough, she was a humanist, so we could kind of understand what we're trying to do. But then she could also like translate, oh, maybe we need to try this, we need to try that. So we sort of had this like change. And it was just fascinating to be in these uh, these meetings where like everybody knows a piece of it and we're all trying to do something together. None of us can do it alone. And uh, and it was exciting because you learned so much. And as you were saying, Ruth, that's sort of how you you pick up this, uh, you know, passing uh, competency uh, in, in these fields. Um, and even just also, I found that um, working with other humanists, it kind of uh, isn't something that you necessarily do that much as, as a historian. Uh, whereas, you know, we had a team not only sort of working with people who are outside of history, but working with other historians. And it was so much fun, to be honest. Like, that was almost the best part of, of, of doing it. Yeah, Dan, I really recognize that as well, the kind of fun and the like getting to be a student again and ask, ask, ask stupid questions, ask naive questions that are actually really open things up has been really nice. And I had a really gentle introduction to it. So some of, some of you might know that my sort of first collaborative work was with my husband, who is a physicist, and we started doing network analysis with letters. Um, and that was really nice because I could ask really stupid questions. I knew there was no judgment whatsoever. Um, and so that was really, um, that was really fascinating. And I got to know all sorts of things about, you know, algorithms that I, you know, that I shouldn't know the names of. And he learned much more about Tudor history than he thought he ever would. Um, and it m made me kind of have the appetite to do something much bigger on the scale of, uh, of living with machines, um, which we'll come back to in a minute with John, but I don't, I don't want to speak to that when, when he can, but I, Maybe we'll come to Marianne first and then we'll go to John. The first thing I was going to say was I like being a student again. And that I mean, collaborative work is absolutely the best thing about being in DH. And in particular for me that I'm a student, I'm really learning and I can ask those questions. What I'd like to bring up is that people that have, is the way in which I've been influenced by students. I've already mentioned that I actually got into this through a student and I'm working largely um, uh, a lot of the projects are really training venues for students or for postdocs, things like that, for people that come in. No charge, it's part of a course. Sometimes they're just volunteering. Because we don't have money to pay them, the payoff is that they get training and they, some of them go on and I've had one of my students go on to do a PhD in computer science and be employed in the IT industry, several of them. But the other thing I'd like to say is the influence of librarians on me and on the projects. That is just, I think they, the did. I don't know how if this is true in the UK, but in the US, digital librarians are exploding. You cannot go, it's called information science now. They don't even call it lib library science. And um, we were lucky at Fordham is that we have access to a digital librarian and medieval studies gets like 15% of her time. And she has taught me so much and about collaboration. She's really opened my eyes to the impact of the digital beyond the narrow audience of just research scholars. So public, my peer review publications reach a really small group of people, but all this digital work reaches millions of people. And this includes the general public, undergraduate students, even high school students. So I think that um, those are really important aspects of the collaborative process is that the audience is also so much wider than it is um, frequently for print publications. 
Thanks, Marianne. That's really true. If we hadn't had the, the um, experience of working in the British Library, we would never done an exhibition. We would never have done the kind of crowdsourcing work that we've done, which they're really experienced in, but none of us have any background in. So it's it's been a, um, a real learning experience. Um, and on, on that point, shall I come to you, John? Uh, yeah, thanks. I mean, I think that's right, because the vision at the heart of living with machines was very much to get away from the model that historians would define a problem and then ask uh, data scientists to, you know, to do the hard maths, as it were, to make it work. And it was to be a radical collaboration where you, and it was quite scary at the beginning because the truth was you didn't have a set of questions that you were going in to find the answer to. You had a set of objectives, which were about how can we leverage a lot more from digital sources than it's possible to do at the moment. How can we um, make them combine them in ways that they haven't been combined? And it was really extraordinarily exciting and slightly frightening in those early stages because we, you were all learning and you were all trying to um, approach questions in a new way. And I think, although there are times in the project for sort of complicated internal reasons, when that hasn't always been the case because people have come in knowing they were only going to be on the project briefly and then you get back to the old style relationship the basic and, and I think we're back now much closer to where we were at the beginning and I think lockdown didn't help in that middle stage where some people thought I'm doing six months on this as part of a rotation as a software engineer and didn't really invest in it as a wider radical collaboration but we're back there now again where it, it, it really is extraordinary and you're doing things that probably nobody in the room would have done but for the collaboration um, and, and everyone's got a stake in it in a, in a way that, as I say, is very different from that clientel relationship with a tech person, which is what I've been used to in the past. And I think that's the most exciting thing about it. I think the good thing we might be able to sort of pin this down a little bit is think about what's good about collaboration and what's hard about collaboration. And, and maybe we'll think first about what for you has been one of the sort of good things that's come out of a collaboration. Where where do you see the payoff from your perspective? So maybe I'll come back to Katrina here. I've got a cynical answer and a good answer. Um, my cynical answer is actually access to resources um, in that bigger projects or these collaborative projects quite often give you access to a lot more behind the scenes resources that you might not be able to access um so at the british library with it was those early days of the the digitized newspapers that i had access to um to to mine the data for and again with um you know you end up building collaborations again with librarians who are crucially important so um Chris at the National Library of, of Scotland's map libraries is, is, has been really good in terms of sharing. And what you find actually is that the digital world are very keen um, in a world where the more and more things get privatised or commercialised. Actually, there is a spirit of, of openness and collaboration over data and, and resources. I think that's that's um, that's the answer for, for that question. Thanks. And coming back to you, John. Um, well, it, there, there are so many, I don't, I don't want to get into the detail of the project, but, you know, there are so many things that I'm immensely proud of that we have managed to do, um, which I could barely imagine four and a half years ago when we were beginning. I mean, I've never heard of computer vision and the fact that we've developed a method um, that allows us to extract information at scale from the entire country's digitized historical maps. And that although we've, owned, we've done that for two things, but you could potentially use that same method to identify a whole range of different features on a whole range of different maps um, in order to understand the, the, you know, the, the spatial past in new ways. I, I find that just exhilarating. And in the same way with the work we've done, um, I'm probably not the only person, certainly on this call, who whenever in the British Library newspaper room would grab these old uh, reference works off the shelves to find out about a newspaper, the newspaper directories and what were its politics, and that we were able 
to to turn that into structured data so that we can now talk about the, the you know the 19th century press across um, all of the different features of it because we've structured that data and then link all of that information as we're doing in a paper and we're actually working on all day today to the content of newspapers so that we can talk about well what was the distinctive language of a conservative newspaper either across the whole period or in a short period how did it differ from all other newspapers or just from liberal newspapers I mean I just find all of that the sort of thing that I didn't even know was possible and incredibly exciting to have been part of. That's really nice to hear John um I, I know I found it really lovely kind of the iterative relationship so from from my own work and, and on the big machines that the kind of leaps you can take so someone will run like a like a really basic query that will allow you quick to quickly see oh I'm seeing this correlation ah if we could then add this additional layer we might be able to get at this question that's been bugging me for a while so it's been it's been that kind of iterative process of discovery discovery together and kind of co-design that's been really refreshing and having different people kind of say what looks interesting so I remember kind of getting initial results from something once and saying to to, to my other half who I've collaborated with I don't understand I don't understand these results he said well from from a statistical point of view this is what I find interesting like oh and then you start layering layering your insights on one and on one another's insights and you get to a really different place and, and it's almost as if the kind of research questions kind of evolve and can become more complex um, as you kind of go through these iterations together so I, I find it a really revealing process um, and I really enjoyed the coming coming at things with a less defined question with a really broad question like is it possible to reconstruct people's itineraries um, and then allow the kind of more nuanced questions about how can we find people who are in the same place at the same moment, giving contrasting accounts of the same event to allow that um, question to emerge out of the data. So that's been something that I've really enjoyed, allowing allowing questions to ferment uh, kind of up from from, from the data. Um, um, so. From the good to the bad. Are there kind of downsides to this kind of working? What, what have been the kind of hard things that people have found? Um, I think John I volunteered to talk about. Yeah, John that. volunteered yeah, to talk about. I'm not, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be um, dealing with a lot of uh, dirty linen. No, I think the thing that I was unaware of, so the computer vision example, that we've created this um, package called Map Reader. It's got all the things I just talked about. But the really interesting thing for me and the bad thing was to understand that the computer scientist who was the key figure in making that all possible at the beginning had incredible difficulty publishing that in the high prestige journals for his subject because he was using a method that was well known, even though he was applying it to an entirely new context and rejigging it and coming up with a, a way of using computer vision that had never been done which is what we call the patch method of breaking up. Um, so in this case, a sheet of a map into multiple small patches and coat and analyzing each one with annotation. He did all of that, but it wasn't innovative enough methodologically in a computer science sense to get into the places that he wanted to. And so to understand the, the disciplinary needs of people in a project like this and the fact that there was a lot of compromise and it slowed up the publication of it and I think it you know it it, it sat his morale in some ways that you know he knew how important it was but application doesn't count in a field which is all about developing um well the theory really of what could be done with computer vision much more than it is about applying it to any particular problem and this is often an issue in in the natural sciences as a whole but it's one that I hadn't even thought about thanks john that's a really good point now the fact that we really saw it as a part of our mission to kind of take everyone's career forwards so it wasn't just one discipline in the service of another so we'd have been a, we would have felt a bit of a failure as a pro project if we'd have produced publications that only forwarded a certain contingency cv and so we've really tried to sort of balance it in terms of people getting the the research findings that really serve their home communities so that they retain a, like a competitive CV going forward but that's been a really hard balancing act and has required people taking turns and 
compromising and um yeah that's the that's the um the flip side of collaboration that um if you want to take everyone with you that compromise is also needed as well as that kind of greater than the sum of the parts kind of um argument that we make um, um so we're coming up towards the end of the the questions that we had um pre -circulate. so keep putting your questions in the chat in, in the Q&A that some of them are really interesting um, and really kind of feed out of what we were just asking. Um, I want to kind of finish with the question to um, people on the panel about what would be one piece of advice you would give to colleagues taking up a collaborative digital project? Um, so um, I'll come to Dan first, if that's okay with you. Well, I always, always used to joke that um, pretty much every DH project is is like an iceberg. You you see like this small amount on top, and what you don't see is the incredible amount of work that it takes just to produce, you know, one visualization or or, or one little article. And I know that I certainly was not at, at all aware of just the amount of time it takes um, to do any DH project. Um, and I think it's it's particularly hard actually in in history and uh and the farther back you go because it tends to be like the farther back you go like the dirtier and the more incomplete your data is and like the more you have to do to sort of make it into a manageable form um so i think just being aware of that is is crucial um and and you know i'm at sort of at the place now where i would also you know somebody who's just getting started i would say well you know do you really need to design a new tool like that that's a lot of work and and you know you can probably do a lot with what's there like maybe you don't need the bentley you know try taking the uh the skoda for a tour and and maybe it's actually enough for what you need um because once you get into that world it's it's there's just so many complications of not only building the thing making sure it actually works but then the upkeep you know, every time the software is renewed, you know, like half of it's broken. So it's uh, it's a whole other game. I remember my colleague, Richard White, um, you know, who's a real pioneer in um, spatial history, used to joke that, you know, he wants his, he sees his legacy in the form of spreadsheets, because at least spreadsheets, you know, everything, it's in its nice little cell, so it lives there forever. You don't have to worry about broken links. Uh, and, and there's a kind of satisfaction to thinking about spreadsheets, so. I think there's a there's a lot of wisdom in what you just said, Dan. I think the sp the spreadsheet point is great. Like, what's the most basic form you can store your data in so that people can kind of take it and do something different with it in the future? And also not apologizing for doing something with more basic methods and not designing the absolutely bespoke thing that's absolutely tailored to your specific research question. There's a lot that's already been done out there that you can adapt. Um, and sometimes you're right, the cutting, we don't need the cutting edge. We don't need chat GPT. We can just do some basic text analysis sometimes to say something really new. And that's something I've just been finishing up, up a book and there was like a text, there's a text analysis chapter and there was like a kind of geospatial chapter. And in both cases, we used quite, you know, basic um, methods to, to say something really new. And in order to answer the research question we had, we didn't need to kind of design a new tool, design a completely bespoke new method. We kind of were able to bring together parts of methods that were worked on elsewhere to write a new narrative, to do something very powerful with the data. So I think that's right, what's, what's good enough? What gets us to say something that is enough for our field? So I think that, that it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not a compromise if it's allowing you to write the history that you, you need to write. Um, John, I think you wanted to say something as well, but also anyone else on the panel who wants to ship in here with sage advice would be very welcome. Well, a couple of things. I mean, one, I many when I was a, a very young lecturer, I remember going to a talk by the Liverpool Linguistics Department, and they gave the sage advice that whenever you were going for funding, you should essentially have already done half the project, because then you could get the funding to start the next one. And to some extent, that's particularly true with what we're doing, that I think if you have already got hold of the data, and it's open, and source data that was the, the other thing i was going to talk about was make sure your work is reproducible i mean the thing i've learned most from living machines is the ethos of turing that everything should be open source and reproducible public data and we have on the project ended up having to reinvent at least one method that had already been done but with closed 
proprietary data that can't be used by anybody else. And so we've done it in a way that now can be used by others along that, you know, they'll have to sign some licenses, but it is reproducible. So essentially get everything in place before you start and get funded partly to do what you'll do next, because it's the most useful piece of advice you'll ever hear. And could, could I just add, yeah, I just want to add two things that haven't really come up explicitly um, in terms of advice about problems that are going to crop up. One is how you give credit to all the people who work on a project, because especially with our project, there's a lot of students. They may be there only temporarily. There's data develop. There are people who, who you might hire even sometimes and, you know, your IT department, whatever. And that I once did a paper on this and was appalled at the variety of how people assess credit. And also you start to hear complaints from people about that they, you know, somebody lingers too long in a higher position when in fact they basically left the project. So that that's, I have no good answers for that. Uh, but I mean, it is a problem. We need to think about it. And the other one is um, archiving. You have to plan for the end of the project. Um, you know, we all talk about sustainability, but it's very possible to leave, you know, mirror sites up, to leave the site up with minimum maintenance, but they're still there. And there is starting to be archiving, you know, project, uh, archiving methods now uh, to get the project a DOI until recently, lots of these projects didn't even have DOI. They, you couldn't find them anywhere unless you deliberately Googled this, you know, the keywords or something. So I think that's another frontier that we're just starting to address. That's a really sage point. I think the credit issue is really hard and one that we had to really consciously think of at the beginning of Living Machines, that we wanted to credit everyone whose work went in, uh, but we had a lot of really long publication lists at the outset and that's normal in some fields, but it's really not normal in history. Um, and we, we've got a, an article coming out in a few weeks, which I think is a six person author list in, in um, technology and culture, which I think they haven't really had before. The contract had to sign and it didn't have spaces for six authors for sure. Um, but also there's a kind of the pressures there of who's going to be assessing these people in the future. So when you go up for a job, are people going to think, oh, you've only done one sixth of the work, which of course is not true. Um, but how do we think about making the different kinds of labor that have gone into that work visible uh, to, to, to panels? So we've thought about like, we've got you know notes on author credits in the footnotes. We've experimented with having a cover sheet when we archive, you know, the, with the archived copy that explains the different roles. But it is also a tension that we want to make sure that some people get some one or two author articles so that they have the things on a CV that make them look competitive. So it's it's a constant a constant um, juggling act, I think. But it's really how you even list them on the website. I mean, you know, the number of publications for most digital projects is relatively small. It's you what you do is you give the URL and your C CV. This is what a student or a project worker, and you might summarize it. So, what's the title you give that person? How close to the top of the list are they? I mean, those are hard decisions when you have big teams. That's a really good point. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go into the questions now. Um, they keep growing, um, and I'm going to probably not deal with them in order because I want to kind of move um, thematically through them. Uh, so please excuse me a second. But there was a really great question from Daniel um, about, he writes, in terms of educating historians, it seems that the only concern in, so, in some spaces this is discussed is whether they can or need to code or not. But what about training people in how to ask questions suitable for DH processors? Um, I wonder if anyone has any responses to that. about, yeah, university education. Um, yeah, uh, Believe it or not, in medieval, if you get a master's degree in medieval studies, you can have a digital humanities minor, which is two courses. And one of them is Python <laughs> and they're taking it. Um, and nobody thinks it's a, but it really does introduce them. But the, most of the way people have done this is on their own or learning by being, you know, so we use TI Publisher, for example. This is not a hard, you know, that kind of tagging is not hard to do. Now, GIS, yes, most of my students who do GIS have had to go to a workshop with somebody like Ian Lancashire, or whatever. That's a better way. GIS is hard to learn by yourself. Um, so I think that the answer varies depending on the technologies that you want to use. Yeah, Dan, do you want to come in? 
Right. I, I, I really agree with what Marianne said. I would just add that I think there is this sort of preliminary question, which is, do you need a technology? And, and which technology, you know, you could, you could spend all this time learning Python or R or ArcGIS. And it turns out that that's actually really not what you needed. So for instance, with mapping the Republic of Letters, at one point there was this question, you know, we're mapping, so shouldn't you be using ArcGIS? And it turned out like, well, like we're not really interested in like what parcel of land was this philosoph, you know, sitting on when he wrote the letter. We're more interested in, you know, who are they talking to across Europe? We didn't need ArcGIS. It was way overkill for the kinds of questions we, we were asking. Um, and and I, I do think that it's, it is sort of important to have that question first. Like, well, what do you want to know? What do you want to find out? Now, there are times, you know, as John was alluding to, where you just kind of want to explore. Like, what could we, what could we do? What could we find out? I think that's probably fine once you've already had some experience in DH. But before you get to that, there is, I think it's really important to ask, like, do you need to invest all this time and effort to, to answer this particular question that you have? I mean, I thought also their question was about how do you get to the point where you understand the subject enough to ask the right questions, even if you're never going to use the tool yourself. And that that is an interesting question, it seems to me. And it it's partly about how do we, I mean, I think we're, we're beginning to have this conversation at Exeter, but, you know, how do we actually understand what it is to have an undergraduate degree in history. Um, I think probably in the mass in, in the American context, it might be a master's level question. You would do it more, but but essentially it, there are things that you should be embedding, even if you're not doing digital skills, so that people think reflexively about what it happens when they do a search, say, in any type of digital source. Because I have to say, my students often don't at the moment really think about well, what what's happening there. Why does this why does this result come out and so on? Don't know what OCR is, so don't understand that half of what's in that thing isn't actually searchable or more than half potentially. Those sorts of things. I think the basic grammar we should be teaching early, wherever early is in your system. And then you can once you've got that grammar, you can start then to ask more informed questions, I think, even if you're not going to learn the tool. I think that's right, John. That sometimes like learning a little bit of Python gives you the ability to understand how a question might be formulated, even if you're not the one doing mm. the coding. Yeah. Or learning a tool gives you the kind of vocabulary to think about things in different dimensions. So maybe the point is not for you to be doing the, the research. It's to be helping you learn enough about the co cognate disciplines to ask the question in a new way. Um, I can say one other thing there. I mean, on the project, I've done no coding, but what I have done a lot of is working with Jupyter scripts where I've at least engaged with the programming and seen it. And I've begun to understand not how to do that, but what that is and how, you know, how to change the different terms in a in a in a code and so on. And um someone saying no code is the future. I mean. My son is a theoretical chemist, and even he is already using chat GPT to do his Fortran coding. And then he goes through the whole damn thing to check that it's right. And I couldn't do that. But I'm sure they're right that there's a there's a future ahead of us when coding is going to be much simpler than it is at the moment. Thank you, John. Um, that I mean, I think that's that's really true. We have had quite a lot of questions about chat GPT. I might come back to those in a moment. Um, one of the really nice questions we had from Tony Curtis was around integrating DH into history being empowered if we had access to experts even in our own institutions, right? So a, a lot of a lot one of the ways that you can learn to ask questions in a different way is by gaining some kind of basic competency in certain tools or programming languages. Um, or working with Jupyter Notebooks. For those of you who don't know, at Jupyter Notebook, we program in Python on the project, but the Jupyter Notebook has the code, but it's annotated to kind of give a human explanation of what's happening. And then you run bits of the code and you can see the output to each of those bits. So it makes it very interactive for those of you who are not actually doing the coding to see what's being spat out at each stage of that process. Um, but actually another way of learning how to ask questions differently um, and to, um, is is to kind of work alongside people and we have so many people who could help us at our own institutions but we're so siloed in departments so 
Has anyone got any thoughts about how we can overcome that difficulty in obtaining help with particular technologies or kind of co-developing research for people from other disciplines um, when universities are set up in departments? It's a really hard question. I'm, and I'm trying to solve it at the moment at my institution. Um, well, I think time. also the problem I said is, is gonna be there. And we're just investing enormous amounts of money in new computer scientists who are meant to be driving interdisciplinary research at Exeter. But as I was explaining to one of the research teams, they're gonna all face the same problem that our colleague faced with MapReader, which is they'll get little credit if what they're doing is applying something that's already been developed. So there's, there's, there's a tension there if they're embedded in a, in a subject area that's gonna reward something different from applied science. And it's, that's a real pity, right? Because we're not really then leveraging the investments that are being made by universities, by funding councils. If we're always like, what's next, what's next, what's next? And not actually taking the thing that we've developed and like really using it to further different domains of um, application. It just seems a really foolish attitude. Although um, I think there's, um, I think, is it the ESRC that have these kind of grants for, you know, leveraging existing data sets and existing tools. So maybe we need to be thinking a little bit more like that. Maybe funding councils mm -hmm. need to be saying, actually, how do we fund research that actually takes pause and makes use of existing tools and use of existing data sets? I don't know if others got thoughts about that. If not, I can, I might move on. Um, what, there's been a, there's a nice question here that might kind of um, key in. Can, can this panel speak about their experiences using qualitative data alongside quantitative data in their digital humanities work? And what challenges should we be mindful of when attempting to do this? Um, thanks to Anne Hanley for that question. Uh, uh, Dan, then Marianne, is that okay? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I like that question a lot. Um, and I guess the way that I mostly approached using digital tools was I didn't think of the tools as what should give me the answer to a question I had, but rather to sort of show me where to look better. So when we were working on mapping the Republic of Letters and we were mapping the correspondences of, of 18th century, 17th century figures, um, when I saw the first correspondence of, of Voltaire, what jumped out at me was this absence, which were letters to England, like Voltaire in England, like there's such, such a long connection. Like you'd think that there would be more letters and they just weren't there. And that actually then sent me back to the letters, back to his, his writings to try to understand, was well, there, is this a data problem? Do we just lose these letters? Did the British not care about holding on to letters from Voltaire the way that you know, other Europeans did? Um, or is there a reason that explains this? And that, that like what, what, you know, came out of that project, really the answer was all through using the qualitative sources. The, the answer wasn't in the data. The data just showed us an interesting problem or an interesting anomaly that we then had had to solve, you know, using the methods that we were more comfortable with. Thanks, Dana. And again, I, I really recognize that, that I definitely move between different registers of analysis that we might kind of um, see like a set of, the, the method might, demonstrate that a set of documents might be worth closer attention, but then you sift through those in a manual fashion, reading them, you, using your kind of archival skills to understand what's going on. Um, and then you might move back to another digital method to try and sift those further. But absolutely, you're kind of moving between those registers and I, I, I kind of seamlessly move between those all, all, all the time. Um, Marianne. Yeah, I mean, the majority of the projects that um, I've been involved in at um, Fordham and Medieval Studies are qualitative data and they focus and part of that is that because we don't have the funding to do the big projects um, the you know the with lots of computational um, uh, techniques and things like that so we have concentrated on uh, presenting resources and that means you're curating which is a word we haven't used much but I think that curating is really a an important aspect of of the digital um, you know how you present it online 
Um, and, you know, we, we're experts. I mean, I happen to know a lot about the sources of medieval London because I, and I had a struggle to get there. I got, I got there in mid career. So I was very sensitive to how hard it was to master this corpus. So I ended up spending a lot of time curating and organizing and annotating for someone who would have been in my, who would be in my position. And I do get a lot of feedback that how great that is, that that's, and that's something you can do online, just the ease of going back and forth. The, where you put the links, things like that. This is not high tech at all. It's learning WordPress or even some, something like Weebly, whatever. It's not. But it can really make a difference when you're communicating with students and with the general public to do something like that. I've also had experience working with digital prosopography where we are using open access software like Omeka S, um, which um, you know, is a wonderful product and it's, uh, it comes at a small cost, but I have gone because people have taught me from learning almost nothing, but just being able to do WordPress to be able to work with backends and things like that. I mean, it's a step-by-step -step process. And they also, these kinds of open access software have large user communities and lots of developers who, as with WordPress, write free plugins um, that are, you know, you can watch YouTube video and figure out how to work with that. So that's, these things are tools to work with qualitative data to reach a wide audience. And there's a great usefulness. It's not as, it can be used for research, but it's often a way to frame research, to introduce people, a wider audience to it. I think that's really helpful because I think we're, we're kind of sometimes choosing, aren't we, between whether we speak to the wide community and make it accessible and serve the community, or whether we can kind of do a deep dive that's kind of accessible only to a few because of the way we're kind of pushing a cutting edge in one particular field. And I, I think that's a, a choice we make. And um, it's, it's sometimes a hard one to make, but different careers take us in, in different ways. And it, it kind of pushing us towards a question that was um, at the bottom um, that William Campbell asked. Um, he noticed that Dan was suggesting we don't necessarily need to be building new tools from scratch. And there is a wisdom in that, he says, but a very tech forward digital history colleague has argued that if we only use tools developed for non-humanities applications, we will often be locked into the epistemological models of the people who created them. So actual humanity scholars need to be building tools. Um, and there's a wisdom in that too. So what are your thoughts on how we might balance those competing uh, objectives? Um, well, maybe to Dan uh, first, but I think others might have thoughts about this. Yeah. I'd happy to take a first step. Uh, I, I agree with that point, actually. And that was why we um, got in the tool making business uh, to begin with. Um, I guess what, I, what I'd say in response is like, at this point, there are a lot of tools that have been made by humanists with humanist methodologies and approaches in mind. So, so I think it's a very different scenario than where we were, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and, uh, but I, I do agree with the fundamental point. I mean, I, I've found, I know that you, Ruth, you've had more luck than I have with Gephi, um, but just the kind, of, the kind of data I had, like kind of made Gephi useless because, you know, it's designed by, you know, mostly by so sociologists for, you know, when you have a complete data set and those of us who work, you know, on 18th, 17th century letters, like it's never complete. And so it doesn't mean anything to like measure a lot of the uh, connection. So, so I think it, there is a real risk that if you sort of follow the tool, like, and sort of start calculating, you know, between this for your, uh, for a data set, uh, it could be total gibberish. So I, I think it's very important to keep this in mind. It's just that at this point, we do have quite a few op options that people can at least, you know, start with that. Thanks, Dan. That's absolutely right, that there has been like a, a few like generations of scholars really pushing into that space. Um, does anyone else want to kind of have a go? At, like, I, I just want to briefly mention, I, I see the point. I'm a little less worried about it because I think there's a lot of tools out there that the humanities can use in innovative ways that they haven't been used before. So we don't need to learn to code. So I have colleagues in medieval studies who are using AR to do a website on medieval New York, an immersive experience in which you can do a walking tour. You can, they're creating an app for this. And also, you know, and there'll be a website. So they've just uh, partnered with a high school architectural design class who were taking some old notes and models of the cloisters, which is the medieval museum in New York. And, um, and, reproducing that in a 3D version to use that. So 
those are all techniques that were not developed by human, humanity scholars, but are can be used in really great ways by medievalists and other humanity scholars. Thanks, that's really great. Um, I'm just looking through the questions. Anyone else got anyone for that, on anything for that before I move? Well, well, just that on the project, we, you know, on Live With Machines, we have definitely been taking tools off the shelf, but then retooling them essentially and retraining them on historical text or as I was saying with the map reader taking a CV tool and it's machine learning sort of back parts but then rethinking how you apply it and to what you apply it and then also testing you know multiple different versions of the machine learning section to see which is the one that's most compatible with a humanistic historical source so I think there is a, I, I agree with what Dan said there's a lot more out there and you just need to be a very critical user and then it's not such a, such a problem. I think that leads nicely into what um, Gillian Parker was asking, which was that most of the methods mentioned so far would be familiar to social scientists and probably geographers. And what would you say distinguishes digital history from these other disciplines? The past. So that's, that's all outside of our <laughs> comfort zone. Again, uh, Dan. I have a funny story here, actually, which is uh, when we were um, early, early times working on mapping the Republic of Letters, we hired a, a CS um, PhD to help us structure the data. Uh, and he came back and said, like, there's a problem with your data. Uh, it's with your date field. And we looked like, oh, really? What? Our dates are wrong? Oh, no. I said, yeah, they're, they're not computing as dates. And it was because they were before 1900. And so <laughs> didn't actually recognize that as a legitimate year. But I think, you know, the, the little anecdote does show that like when you deal with time and time scales, especially long time scales, it's a very different story um, and, and forces you. To, I think this is one of the reasons why we do need uh, often to adapt visualizations to, to take time, the passage of time um, into account. How do you represent time going by? Like even if you're trying to show connections between nodes, how do you do that over time? That's a really big challenge. And there's not there's not like an obvious answer. It's probably going to depend a bit um, on your on your questions, on your data. You know, sometimes you don't have the time anyway. So these are the things I think actually make it more challenging when you're when you're doing this work than if it's sort of, you know, second half of the 20th century. Yeah. And I think as well as like missing dates or uh, you've got things like temporal uncertainty or geographical uncertainty and these fuzzy geographies and how do we kind of make sure that we um, keep that data but know that it is it is hazy or kind of not to be trusted uh, but do we still want to consider it? Um, these are all kind of pressing questions that I think are actually useful for the data science community to be to be considering because they're hard they're hard technical questions um yeah anyone Can else to that one in terms of sources as well and um dealing with historic maps um you know we know that maps are human products humans and the further back you go um the more interesting they are for the historian because they show particular things that that person who was drawing the map or commissioned the map wanted to show. And I found that working with modern or contemporary GIS um, struggled with that because you've got um, problems in how you digitize or at least in a digital format represent um, those representations of the past. And that applies to a lot of other sources. So how do you have a large sample of different maps um, and how do you, you measure the 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 consistency between them is again, these are all methodological, but also philosophical questions that historians pull out of the sources that um, historical knowledge and contextual information enables us to discuss that doesn't neatly fit within a box of, of, of your on, off the shelf um, software. That's a really nice point. I'm gonna shift now to the large number and the large number, but several questions we've had about chat GPT. Um, so the first one of those was, History is it still relevant? Is it still relevant in the Chat GPT world? Um, another question was: um, Will Chat GPT and the like bridge or completely remove the skills gap? Given that we can ask it to put code, etc., together for us, what might the ramifications be of this? And then someone thought: oh, What are your thoughts on Chat GPT and its impact on skill? Um, 
so I wonder what 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 your kind of um, answers to those are. I know I have some thoughts as well, but I'd like to come. Is it is it is it a good thing for the digital history community? Um, do we have answers that are not coming from elsewhere? Um, is it is it going to enable us, or is it or is it presenting new challenges? Who wants to come in with it? It's it's mainly making me happy that I'm retired and I don't have to do grading anymore. That was that's pretty much my main response. Yeah, I also worry about it more with student essays. Um, I mean, frankly, I think one of the interesting things that that's emerged with ChatGPT is that it's um, it just makes stuff up, um, and and also. You know, it can only work with what it's been fed, um, and so so much of what we're doing in in DH projects is usually, you know, taking a data source that has not already been nicely processed, chewed up, and made available, and and looking at it in a in a way that has not been explored yet. So so yeah, I could see how Chat GPT might be helpful for writing a little bit of code if you know exactly what you need for that, but I mean, most of the time you don't know exactly what you need uh, and you're you're not even sure, like you got to design the thing first, you got to put the data into, into order. So if it is helpful, it seems to me that it would only really help with very small pieces of what we're, what we traditionally been doing in DH. And I guess one of the problems that we would have as historians is we can't do the kind of source criticism with it because we can't kind of see the origins of, of what it's been, what it's been trained on, but um, I think one of the ways of living machines that we've been thinking in ways related to this is we, we, we built our own <laughs> language model of 19th century um, text. So um, this was uh, using kind of the previous generation of technology. So we, um, we did a version of BERT, which we call BLIRT, which was um, trained on BL, the BL Books Corpus, which are around 60,000 19th century books. So we decided we, we know what we're modeling and we model this particular 19th century corpus in order to understand the language. But then we sort of started playing games with it. And I think that's where kind of a literary or a kind of humanities perspective comes into play because we were trying to chip it up to see where it didn't work. We were hiding words from it to see what it would predict based on that probability distribution. So we, we hid the word machine. <laughs> we wanted to we wanted to know kind of um, we wanted to find examples of where um, machines are being anthropomorphized or um, humans were being turned into uh, machines. Um, and so we kind of played a game with it. We wanted to see where we could chip it up to see how language was evolving and to see where kind of um, creative metaphorical things were happening that machines really couldn't model because it was doing something unexpected. And I think that's where we have something, a different perspective to, to offer, that we're, trying, we're actively trying to read against the grain with it. Um, and being a really kind of self-reflective and critical, uh, entering into a self-critical process with, with the um, language model. Um, so we'll probably have time for another couple of questions. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to talk and, and uh, field questions at the same, same time. Um, Can I answer the one on citizen? Office? Yes, please do. That would be great. Because I've I've got a lot of experience with that. And what I've found the, the usefulness of digital tools is actually um, in co-production of research with communities. So I did two projects, one for the Peterloo commemorations um, in 2019 and another one for a similar kind of um, local project on the Kennington Chartists and what really engages people who might not really have any skills at all in digital history or academic interests is um, family history and local, local history and those two things you can really use really simple free off, off the shelf tools to really engage people um, because we've also got um, census data and parish records freely you know available at least in libraries and that's the way that actually those projects which were both um lottery funded really sort of i think 
um, engage the community in, in this idea of local history, family history, and then connected them to a bigger political story and, and history was through helping people map where their ancestors came from or, um, you know, what whether their ancestor was involved in this particular event. And I think there's lots of potential, particularly pro those types of projects to again, break that skills gap or at least introduce people to um, the potential of doing sort of digital history research. Um, really nice. Citizen, yeah. Citizen scientist is uh, uh, the terminology used by Zooniverse, which is a crowdsourcing platform. And again, uh, I had an MA student who uh, worked on the Medieval Londoners project and then crowdsourced through Zooniverse. This was her MA thesis. Um, uh, digitized transcriptions of deeds and set it up so that these people would transcribe it and fill out certain questions that would then the data will be eventually dumped into the medieval Londoners database. So they're going to get credit. They're going to be contributors, catalogers for this database. And uh, she was astonished and I was, but how popular this was. And the uh, number of people who signed up, it was within a couple of weeks, it was 1200 people. And I mean, which is a lot. And these are not academics and the enthusiasm because the Zooniverse platform allows you to keep track of, do they really stay? Because a lot of these projects are scientific and people get bored very easily. So they don't stay. And her project had a way longer uh, retention rate, for example. And it really showed her, because this is what her MA thesis was about, was how many people, the general public, you know, it, it's hard to know how much they, re they really want to know. It was called um, what um, Get to Know Medieval Londoners. And it just attracted them. And so that to me was a very satisfying way to engage the general public. Um, it turned out there were a few people who said, oh, I did medieval history as an undergrad and this is so great. But the vast majority were people in the UK and it was featured in Who Do You Think You Are? It was one of their chosen projects for their transcription Tuesday this past January. So a lot of family historians. That's a really nice example. I think that that you're right, that it's a way for people to really engage with historical documents and that people find it really exciting. And we were, um, I think Mia, um, who was on our project, one of the co-eyes, just put it in the chat that we we also had some Zooniverse um, tasks and we've had really great feedback from people saying that they've really enjoyed the task. And they've even sort of raised like really interesting questions and become super engaged with the kind of underlying intellectual premises of the project in, in a way that, I mean, I hadn't anticipated because I don't work in that space and we're, we're very lucky to have Mia kind of guide us through that space. So we're very thankful to her uh, for that. Anyone else want to uh, No, I was going to go, um, we're kind of coming up to time and I want to just um, uh, leave space for something thinking about the kind of wind down of projects. Um, because I think Marianne, you touched on this about thinking about the afterlife. And so Anne Hanley had another question. Should the, the panel have spoken briefly about the afterlives of digital projects? What should historians be thinking about when looking for long-term homes that digital outputs and making these resources accessible beyond the standard five to 10 year window? And I think, you know, um, this is something we should be thinking about from the very start of projects. So it'd be really great to hear the wisdom of the, the people at the table here. Um, I could speak briefly to that. As I said, um, I'm lucky. I'm in, you need to get institutional support. You cannot have your own website and expect it to survive. And the problem is that if you switch institutions, you know, if that institution has supported you, then the project might not be portable. And I tell this all the time to new people. We get postdocs that come and work with us just to learn some of these techniques. And we can't host their projects. They need, but if they have a postdoc for three years, I make it clear to them that unless you do something, that project is going to be gone when you leave the university because they are not committed to supporting things unless you get something in writing. And so all the projects that we have are, I the, one, the active ones are, uh, the institution of the Center for Medieval Studies through Fordham University is committed to maintaining them, uh, but the others are archived, you know, and we have archive project uh, and uh, we're trying to go through a process, I said, to archive them to create formal documentation on uh, on the archiving process so that people can track what we did over time. Maybe as historians, we should be very... <laughs> <laughs> very au okay with the idea of archiving things and thinking about like leaving that legacy and documenting it for others to kind of 
take up those bits. We have some other really interesting questions um, and I'm just, I think we've probably nearly run out of time. Um, I wonder if one that we should just um, deal with at the end is this one that just came in from Tanya Fox. She said, as a person of the global majority, Eurocentricity of historical research available on the internet means that the data informing these automations have a Eurocentric bent. Um, so, you know, if we're producing training data on like 19th century books or like we did, what are the ways that we need to kind of push against that to think about what's not there? And um, I think that would be a really nice final thing that we could we could speak to um, if the panel had time. And sorry, D Dan had to step out because he had a family emergency. It's really well, I mean, <laughs> done. Well, I mean, I was going to say, obviously, we, we live with machines. We were explicitly funded to do a project on British digital resources and you know the follow-on work is likely to be about infrastructure digital infrastructure in Britain and there's a certain sense in which that's part of the problem it's not just that most of the the models and algorithms are, are trained on um, European and indeed a lot of them on English language text but it's also that that's where a lot of the money is to do the research in the first place because there's nothing intrinsic in what is being done that makes it necessary that it should be. Um, and there are people working in Europe who are trying to apply those tools and get that money and, and use it outside of um, the privileged Western economies, but, but, but it needs to be broader than that. Yeah, that's right, John. And also I think there's a problem with the uh... The underlying structures we're working with we're we're working with digitized collections that are based on like the collection policies of the past so it's like yeah. it's bias all the way down and i think we first of all need to do the kind of work that we've been pushing to do on living machines which is to kind of quantify the biases we have to work out where we need to start mm. addressing the gaps right and then we need to be doing targeted things like building the archives and digitization policies around the gaps that we perceive and then we need to be selecting tools and methods that don't that are able to read against the grain, that aren't paying attention to the big data points, but allow us to look at the outliers, the edge cases. Um, and so we can need to be designing our research processes so that we can attend to the particular. Um, and I think that's that's really important. Do we, does anyone else have anything to add to that? If not, I think we are almost at time and it's probably my duty now to hand back to um, Emma Griffin um, as our as president and uh, to let her close proceedings. But thank you so much to, um, to John and to Katrina and to Marianne and to Dan for joining us today for this really wonderful conversation. I've really enjoyed having it and, and hosting it and we, we could have talked all evening, but um, I will shut up now and hand back to Emma. So thank you all very much. Well, Ruth, I don't know if it's really a matter of um, shutting up. I would like to say thank you so much to the panel. Um, thank you for the audience, for the wonderful questions. As um, Ruth and John have indicated, I'm part of the Living With Machines project as well. So it's quite unusual that I sit and chair the, or sit in the background of these events and, and have quite so many questions and think, oh, yeah, that's a great question. And what is the answer to that question? And, and, and it's just been really a very, very fascinating discussion for me so thanks to the panel and hopefully a very very fascinating and interesting useful discussion for our large international audience as well before you go i would just like to let you know that we've got a few more events coming up on tuesday the 13th of june we've got another online panel taking this uh, same format as today on eric williams capital capitalism and slavery and um, so that's an opportunity to discuss um his obviously very major work capitalism and slavery with a panel just as we're doing today for the members of society, we've also got a closed online training workshop about getting your research into the media, an introduction and guide for historians, and that takes place on Wednesday, the 21st of June. Um, and I should also flag up at this point that we've got our annual Prothero lecture, lecture coming on, up on the 5th of July, Wednesday, the 5th of July at 5 p.m. And we have the wonderful Brenda Stevenson, um, the Hilary Rodham Clinton Professor of Women's History at Oxford University. She'll be talking about enslaved, Black life, courtship and marriage in the antebellum South. You can find out more about everything that we're doing by looking at our website. Um, if you're not already a member, look at the website and think about how to get involved. We would love to welcome you into the society. Um, but for now, it just uh, remains for me to say thank you to everybody here. Thank you to our audience and enjoy this uh, lovely warm evening. Bye bye. <laughs>